Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Ron said, um, I'm from the Spirit Adventure Trust in New Zealand. Um, for those of you who may not know where that is, it's as far away from Riga as you can get before you hit the South Pole. So um, uh, it's our, our pleasure to present our business model. Um, we do things a little differently to how perhaps a lot of the sail training organisations in the Northern Hemisphere do it. And um, I was asked to just present how we do it and how we run the business in New Zealand. If it gets a bit dry, I apologise, and I look forward to the questions afterwards. So we were an um, organisation that was formed as a charitable organisation in 1972 by, by a gentleman called Mr Lou Fisher. It was his dream to provide sail training to the uh, youth of New Zealand. And he actually built our first ship, the Spirit of Adventure, and uh, gifted it to the Trust. So that was a, a major start for us. It was a topsail schooner, and uh, it was painted white, and it's always referred to in New Zealand as the white ship. Unfortunately, in 1997, we sold it off, and it's now uh, resident in Fiji. Our current ship is called the Spirit of New Zealand. It's a three-masted barkentine. It's now 25 years old, and uh, works pretty hard. Now, our focus in New Zealand is to deliver structured youth development programs. So it's really much aimed at a 16 to 18 age bracket in New Zealand. The ship has, uh, over the years, um, sort of become part of the national icon of the country, um, and we refer to it as a Kiwi icon. New Zealanders are referred to as Kiwis. Um, and no matter where it goes in New Zealand, it attracts a crowd naturally, and we are the largest and probably the only real sail training organisation in New Zealand. We have a few other smaller ones, but nothing to the extent that we do. Now, um, it's an interesting, over the uh, day or so I've been here, we've been talking about sail training international and, and what we're doing. We don't actually use the word sail training in New Zealand. Um, in fact, as you see in our mission statement, we use the medium of the sea to deliver our program. So we aren't, if I use the word sail training in New Zealand, it conjures up to the bulk of the public that we are training sailors to go out and race and win the America's Cup and that sort of thing. But ours is very much youth development. The other key fundamental principle to our organisation is every New Zealander can get on board that ship regardless of their financial circumstances. So if you do not have the funds to pay for the fee, we will help you find it. So no one is prevented from getting onto the ship. Um, we deal obviously in that very tight youth market and in New Zealand we have a, a lot of um, requirements around that. We work with the government as well. So our values, our, our intents, have to be very much out there in the public to give confidence to parents and families to actually send their children to us. Yeah. So our structure, we have a trust board uh, of eight members. In fact, we've just increased it to ten. They're all basically hand-picked. My chairman is sitting there probably critiquing my performance as I'm doing this. And um, they, are, they are recruited to the trust for their skill sets, lawyers, accountants, and that type of thing, to make sure that we are well positioned as we move forward. I lead a, a full-time staff of 20. Uh, we have eight shore-based staff to actually run the business and the balance of the 12 seagoing staff. And those 12 staff at sea are split into two groups and they work basically a 10-day rotation. We also rely very heavily on a volunteer base and usually these are trainees that have come through the system and return as volunteers, but equally within the New Zealand community we have a very strong maritime flavour and people will volunteer to work on the ship. We currently have around 150 volunteers, but this will fluctuate from time to time. We also run as part of our program a professional training program for young people who want to go to sea as professional seafarers. So at any given time, we'll have three cadets working with us as they go through their professional training. So as I said, the uh, sea staff consists of a master. Now, I heard in a presentation yesterday that the master usually gets the best cabin on the ship. We're a pretty much an egalitarian society in New Zealand. The master's cabin's the same as everybody else's in New Zealand. Um, we have a first mate and second mate, cook and engineer. Uh, those are the core crew. We sail with the two cadets, two of any of the three cadets. We have three volunteer watch leaders. Two of those are experienced and the third one is normally under training. And the other important part of our program is that two of the trainees that have done the program can return as leading hands, engage with the next crop of trainees but are working with the crew to help deliver the program. And that's quite an important aspect of the thing. 
Now, one of the beauties of New Zealand is we have some extensive and safe sailing grounds, and we at the Trust sail our ship for around about 320 days a year. Um, normally, the ship will come into port at 7 o'clock in the morning, and by 12 it has, has gone again. So we turn the ship around in five year hours, we take the uh, crew off, the trainees off, reprovision it, restock it, and it sails by 12. So that's a pretty good turnaround. Um, now the uh, sailing areas around New Zealand, this is the country, um, if I can get this to work, up here is our home port in, in Auckland. Now these sailing grounds here are pretty good, so we spend our winter in those sailing grounds, it's quite well protected, no matter what the conditions, the ship sails and delivers a program. Down here in the south, again, very good sailing grounds, but we tend to use those in our summer period, which is what we're coming into now. And in fact, our ship will leave um, Auckland just after Christmas and circumnavigate the country, taking all those sailing grounds and delivering the program. We seldom go offshore. Now, as I said, we deliver youth programs. So our core program is a 10-day youth development voyage for 16 to 18-year-olds. As an exception, we will accept 15-year-olds, but they are the exception. And we will deliver 20 to 25 of these programs throughout the year. We also deliver one five-day inspiration voyage for those with physical disabilities. We can't take wheelchairs, but by and large, we will accommodate most other physical disabilities. For a slightly younger age bracket, the 14 to 15, we run five-day spirit trophy voyages, about six to eight of those a year. And we run a few specialist programs for those students who have been elected to senior positions within their schools. It's called the Student Trustee Training Program. We do allocate a number of sailings throughout the year for both sponsor and public engagement, but to be fair, we don't push the public ones that much. They aren't they don't actually return much to the trust, to be fair. We try and use them for corporate promotion, actually engaging with specific areas of our community to actually build and, and gain the support. So as I said, the, uh, the core business of the trust is the 10-day program. It, obviously, it's 10 days. Um, we have 40 people on board the ship, 20 boys and 20 girls. We work very hard to achieve that gender balance. Interestingly, in New Zealand, we have a far stronger interest from the female population. I don't know if that occurs elsewhere, but certainly we have a bigger waiting list of girls than we do for boys. You must be a complete stranger to the other 39 people. We do not allow friends or family to join you on that trip. So it's 40 strangers. We work hard in recruiting the trainees to come from a diverse socio-economic background, geographic spread across the country, and also cultural backgrounds. Uh, in, in New Zealand, we have three principal um, cultures. We have the European, like myself. We have our indigenous people, the Maoris, and we have a large Pacific Island contingent as well. So we work hard to make sure we get a mix from that. We also have a, an Asian population and a, and a smattering of international students. When you join the ship, we take everything off you. No phones, no computers, no electronic devices. You're allowed a camera. And that's it. <laughs> um, just a little side note. We, um, we, ask, we, we tell them up front when they sign up that you must surrender all these. And when they come on board, they usually hand them over to the crew and they're secured in the master's cabin. Um, we got one guy with five cell phones over the 10 days. We actually got all five cell phones off him. It's interesting. They ring home and their mum rings the office and they wonder why we work it out. Okay, so during the 10-day voyage, um, we don't, for teenagers, carry enough uh, water to let them shower every day. So they do actually get a shower before they go home, but we, ad we address the ablutions another way. The ship is a medium, so they are sailing a tall ship. It's part of the team building, part of the youth development program. But it's, it's a means to an end. It's not the actual end. We're looking about building in the individual. It's not about um, becoming sailors or anything like that. It's about taking you out of your comfort zone and building you as an individual. I heard somewhere yesterday someone say, you know, it's fun. Well, that is one of the important things. They must have fun. They must go away with a positive experience. Um, they build lifelong friendships. One of the uh, positives out of the social media uh, revolution is that most of the voyagers will create their own Facebook page and remain engaged after the event. 
Um, the sh we probably spend about half of the time off the ship delivering the program, as so it's not all about being on the ship. It's as much land-based as it is water-based, but we actually go away from the towns. The ship is pretty much closed. We don't let allow a lot of public engagement with the ship when they move around the coast. One of the new unique aspects of our 10-day voyages is that on the night of the eighth day, the 40 teenagers will sit down and elect from amongst themselves their own crew, their own master, mates, cooks, engineers. On the ninth day, the crew hand the ship over to the trainees and they bring the ship home. We leave the crew on board, we're not quite that silly, but um, the, uh, so the kids are responsible for the ship on the last day and that's a significant empowerment that we provide to those young people. So why are we doing it? Well, those are fairly self-explanatory. Um, Obviously, in this case, we obviously try and get all the crew to the top of the mast. It's one of those achievements. You'll be surprised how many people don't like heights, but um, we don't force them. But those are the sort of things that we're trying to engender into the young people. So how do we do it? So what, how do we actually deliver this to the people of New Zealand? Well, we have a very specific model. We work with the secondary schools or the colleges of New Zealand. There's around 455 of them spread out in New Zealand. We have around 355 of those on our books, and about 250 of those are actively engaged. So each school is normally allocated one male, one female birth, obviously not on the same voyage. They can apply for more, and obviously we have some schools hub who are particularly engaged with the program who will naturally be allocated more births. We set our sailing program for the calendar year in June of the previous year, so already next year is fully mapped out. We go to the schools with their allocations saying on voyage X you have a male birth and on voyage Y you have a female birth. Obviously there's a bit of negotiation and horse trading around um, when, how we sort of settle that down. They can ask for more. If schools don't take up their allocation they are reallocated. It's up to the school to select the student. We don't actually get involved in that process. Some schools um, use it as a, a reward for high achieving students, and that's fine. Equally, a lot of schools will use it for students who have yet to realise their potential and see this as one way of unlocking the, uh, that potential. Um, and then there are some schools, obviously, who come from the very uh, lower socioeconomic areas that struggle to fill the berth, and we actively work with them to make sure we get those students on as well. If you aren't selected by your school and you do want to get onto the ship, you can apply through the public application process and that's what creates our waiting list. And currently we have a waiting list of around 200 students. As I said earlier, we do not prevent any student from getting onto the ship who can't pay the fee. So if a student says, hey, I'm keen, we will work with them and their families to help them source funding support and if all else fails, uh, we'll step up to the mark. We normally sail full at 40. Over the year, we average a 97% occupancy rate. We have a couple of voyages um, at various times of the year that we struggle to fill because we clash with school activities. So how do we fund it? Well, the Trust is, uh, in New Zealand is a charity, so we're obviously not involved in taxation, which kind of helps and makes all the donations and that tax deductible. We have an annual operating budget for the business of around 3 million New Zealand, and if I got the conversion right, that's about 1.89 million euro. The fee for the 10-day voyage is 1,800 New Zealand dollars, or 1140 euro. The voyage fees account for about 65% of our income, but it's only the income that helps the day-to-day -day running of the business. It's not actually aimed at maintaining the ship. If we took in the ship's costs, then the fee would become more of a challenge for the young people and we address that another way. Somewhat unique to New Zealand for the charitable sector is the funding that we receive from gaming trusts. These are trusts that run the pokey machines, the one-armed bandits where you put your money in and hopefully win something. In New Zealand, all the proceeds from that have to be distributed to charities. And to be fair, most charities in New Zealand rely very heavily on that. It's worth about... 300 to 400 million New Zealand dollars a year to charities. 
Our annual ships maintenance is around 300,000 New Zealand and we seek funding support from that, principally from the philanthropic organisations and the gaming trusts. We are having a couple of capital refits, one in 210 and one right now, the ship's in a major refit at 1.5 million. And as I said, most of the funding for those two activities have come out of the community, not from our own coffers, which is fortunate. So here's a little bit of a sample of what we do on the ship, just to give you a bit of a flavour of what we do in our terms of our 10-day voyage. Um, so obviously we have our 40 kids, they always get a voyage photo to start with. The kids are split into four watches of ten, again five boys, five girls, trying to keep that gender balance. Every one of those young trainees will get an opportunity to lead their watch during the ten days. Um, the only way they can get off the ship is on those rafts, so um, it's all about teamwork. We also carry a couple of sailing luggers on the ship, it's pretty good. Uh, again, a watch will take a lugger and sail off and do their thing. Again, it's about building that sort of resilience, teamwork, getting out and about, and obviously the young lady in the back there is having a bit of fun. As I said before, a lot of our activities are shore-based, so the ship will sail around the coast, anchor up, find a suitable location, and then the trainees will go ashore. Um, one of the big aspects that we do is every voyage will go to a bay and clean the bay up from an environmental aspect, and we will bring the rubbish back and dispose of it accordingly. Um, barbecues, um, getting involved in the things in the bush, the old shore tramp. We aren't into major uh, mountain climbing or abseiling, it's just a basic day walk through the, through the um, various parts of New Zealand. One of the features of the uh, ship is the aft or great cabin. We can seat all 40 students there in that tiered seating arrangement. That's where all the activities take place. Um, it's actually a great facility. And one, if you ask the 60,000 plus trainees um, what it is they remember about their 10 day voyage, it will be the 6.30 swim. And this is how we address the uh, fact that they don't have hot showers, we give them a cold swim. So every morning at 6.30 they're in the tide for a swim, um, no matter where the ship is. And I can tell you when there's sleet on the deck it's a bit brisk in the morning. Oh, a bit too quick there. So what are our challenges in New Zealand? Well, we, ha we compete against an extensive range of other organisations that deliver outdoor programs for Kiwi kids. And in fact, a lot of those are commercial entities simply looking to turn a profit. So in trying to sell their product, they sell it into the youth market. So we're, we're competing against that. The other thing is that we operate all year round. We make no recognition of the school year as such. You'll get students who will want to book a voyage that coincides with school holidays. That just doesn't happen. So uh, sometimes, and I mentioned earlier on, that we have a couple of voyages that we struggle to compete because that's during the exam process. Um, and then quite often we'll get international students to help fill that. So the duration away from school is a bit of a challenge. Our ongoing funding, like probably most organisations, is a challenge. Trying to find that funding support for the trainee voyage fees to make sure everyone can get on board the ship that has to. The ongoing ship's costs. Uh, the ship is currently 25 years old. We're, we're working hard to make sure it lasts for at least another 25 years, and at which point uh, in 2035 we'll be looking at around about 44 million to replace the ship. And that is our ship. So, as I said, it's a three-masted barkentine. It's painted black because that is New Zealand's colours and in terms of uh, what we do, and the silver fern is one of our national symbols, so that's why we uh, do that. And she sails around the coast, has a high profile, and... Uh, yeah, there you go, folks. That's how we do it in New Zealand. Hello, my name is Lata. I'm from Russia. And um, I prepare this um, report, uh, which I would uh, maybe name uh, analytical or even informational. You will find more statistic and facts in this uh, than conclusions or decisions. Um, yes. Uh, the first thing I want to say that uh, this report uh, prepared with a great support, informational of many many teams. This is the result of work of uh, many bodies. So thank to all friends, and I see my group of support here. Thank you, you come <laughs> to hear this. I'm a little bit nervous, feel myself uh, maybe too important. Uh, uh, 
during two years, uh, we structurally collecting information. So there, this information is uh, get from open sources uh, as a result of our activities, uh, and uh, just requested, uh, for example, from Ministry of Fishing. Uh, if you think this is not full information, you are welcome to add to send to me. Um, my special thanks to Ministry of Fishing, uh, Maritime Council of St. Petersburg, uh, University of Water Communication, and uh, our wonderful Windjammer Smir Sidov, uh, and uh, our Salient Ore team, Atlantic Challenge Russia. Uh, you will see pictures which is from my collection, our camera lady Olga Tarvit, and uh, Valery Vasilevsky. His pictures uh, are the best. Even if the report will not be interested, you will enjoy his uh, beautiful masterpiece um, illustrations. So there will be two parts in my, in my report. Uh, information about sail training activities in Russia, vessels, projects, type of activities, and uh, team. And uh, about project sailtraining.ru. Uh, this is the integrational attempt uh, to collect structure publish, share information, to create a field to share our methods, ideas, and to integrate our sail training activities in Russia. So let's go to the first part, where we are. I think you all know what we have five tall ships, but many people know we have three tall ships. Actually, we have five. So we have Sedov, Kruzenstern, Mir, Nadezhda, and Pallada. We have a group of smaller vessels, uh, private, uh, government, and not governmental organization. It's Standard, uh, Nadezhda, Svetitel Piotr, uh, Unibaltiets. We have some yachts who is doing sail training activities. We have uh, Yon Seaman Club. This is a local center for younger people. And in Soviet time, it was a very strong and system activities. Uh, now it's uh, in the stage of rebuilding. Um, we have sail and ore teams, um, like luggers you have in New Zealand. Uh, we have sail and sports schools. And uh, sometimes Russian youngsters participate in, in foreign projects. Let us talk some about each of these uh, element. Our tall ship. So we have uh, five wind jammers. Uh, they belong to academies and universities. Uh, they are, have to serve to educate professional seamen, merchant, and fishing fleet. Uh, we have no navy sail training ship in Russia. Only merchant and fishing fleet. The greatest and the eldest one is Sidov the fastest and the most famous in regattas, it's Mir. Uh, biggest number of cadets during the year, it's Kruzenstern. And in the far east, we have Nadezhda and Palada. Uh, the um, most famous ship owner is a Ministry of Fishing. It has flotilla of three tall ships. Sidov, based in Murmansk State University, Technical University, Kruzenstern, Baltic State Academy, Kaliningrad, Pallada on Far East State Technical University. Uh, this uh, ship is used as a sail training base for cadets not only from these three ports. Uh, any um, college or university uh, which belongs to the Ministry of ship, uh, Fishing can send cadets. So for statistic, it's uh, 12 cities, 14 uh, colleges and universities. Uh, during this year, for example, uh, more than uh, 1,100 1, cadets uh, passed sailing practice about this free vessel. And uh, we know that additionally, European trainees uh, is sailing short legs, not a long term, uh, aboard Kruzenstern and Sidov. Uh, the regular trip for cadets is about three or four months, and short legs can be two weeks or three weeks. And I got statistic that uh, it's uh, 1,100 uh, cadets and about 1,000 of uh, European trainees. So uh, now it's actively used for this option. The interesting fact that uh, during the last 10 years, uh, Kruzenstern and Pallada completed four uh, around the world trip. And now uh, the Ministry of Fishing 
have the fifth circumnavigation up to the moment. Uh, the set off is, and how it works? And, and where, uh, where is this laser pointer? How it works? Yeah. Uh, I think that this is uh, one of the first um, example when uh, this circumnavigation is had very good media support. Uh, it's mostly in uh, Russian-speaking field, but uh, it's really uh, many uh, TV case and uh, some magazine in internet, so you can find in Facebook and join and uh, with us uh, follow this circumnavigation. Uh, the uh, final date will be here, you see. It's uh, 24th July, Sidov have uh, be back uh, in St. Petersburg. So the circumnavigation will last for 14 months, more than 45,000 miles, five continents. Uh, they will change uh, cadets three times. First of all, it was in Casablanca after European part, now in Vladivostok, and so it's um, 100 credits each time. Uh, and the interesting uh, cooperation is that now local young seamen club can send uh, five or 10 youngsters to sail shorter leg, for example, one month. And it was free such a group of these uh, um, youngsters. Okay, uh, Ministry of Transport, Flatia, it's Samir uh, and Nadezhda Miral Makarov, you know. Uh, I know everybody knows Mir. Uh, and uh, his uh, uh, win, uh, he is showing us a beautiful uh, example of sea practice. Uh, Nadezhda is uh, on Pacific Ocean. I think that Pacific Ocean friends knows more about her. The smaller ships we have. This is a standard frigate. I think many of uh, people here knows uh, our standard because it operates actively. Uh, it's non for profitable organization. Um, now based in Holland for a um, small peculiarity of Russian law system. I hope soon we will meet our standard in the home port in St. Petersburg. They involve about 100 youngsters a year, so operating as a sail training vessel. We have a new beautiful ship, Schooner Nadezhda. Uh, it's a private owner who invested uh, more than 1 million euro so he um, he is not like to use Nadezhda as a sail training vessel, but sometime we can meet her. It's a 100 years old uh, German uh, built in uh, Holland and have very interesting story. Okay, what about uh, yachting in Russia? Uh, you can see a picture of our uh, flagship Akela, and Akela is actively taking part in all ship races, so you know. Uh, the vessel belong to um, University of Waterway Communication, and uh, as well, University has nine more yachts. They are not using so it's the same to the same extent. Uh, we have uh, like Soviet heritage. Uh, this is a public yacht club. There are not many in Saint Petersburg River Yacht Club. There is Zvezda, Varyak, Vea. Uh, you maybe meet them on tall ship races, and. Um, the yachts uh, who was in Navy Yacht Club, which is now not exist, and uh, there is an attempt to make a new structure, Nevsky Yacht Club, and you know as well this yachts, it's Belina, Yunga, Argo, Diana, and some others. We have a sailing school for practice for those uh, certifying for skippers, and Yelena, Rus, and maybe Briz will serve as this. And there are private yachts as a Nika. But uh, this flotilla is not united to one structure. It's just about 20 yachts, uh, just interesting for uh, working with young people. Uh, the uh, Russian uh, yachting tradition is a long sailing trip. So for example, uh, this uh, summer, 
we have at least three voyages more than 1,000 nautical miles and three voyages more than 5,000 nautical miles. Uh, for my evaluation, it's about 100 youngsters uh, involved uh, each year. So what do we have more? Uh, we have strong tradition of sail and oar training. In Soviet time, in uh, many university and many local seamen young club, uh, it was a monotype uh, Russian Navy six oars yawl. Uh, this is a good thing because it's a uh, monotype. Uh, now uh, it's uh, actively used and only in St. Petersburg annually. We have five rowing and two, two sailing big regattas. We have expeditions. Uh, and my evaluation is about more than 500 uh, youngsters, students is involved every year. What is the uh, good things in sail and oar activities? This is a good school of seamanship. This is really cheaper than yachts or tall ship. This is an option to involve many people. So you can uh, involve 100, even only 10 you will have in your team later. Uh, not restricted uh, with draught and half of mast. This is important for Russian rivers and lakes because we have bridges, we have shallow waters, and uh, if you have this uh, type of boat, it's much more easy to sail than a uh, keel yacht. Okay, what about uh, younger people? Because we know that uh, they have uh, to start sometime earlier than in 16 or even 20. There is numerous team and organization, and they have a big diversity of organization forms. Some of them municipality or uh, public initiative, private initiative, or even sport team. Uh, for example, oh sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, the very good um, example, which I met only this year, it's a Nizhny Novgorod Maritime Club. It's a private initiative just uh, People decide to sail and to involve youngsters of different age. Small children have the navigation of school, how they say. They sail an optimist on Volga, and they send a group of youngsters to join Stockholm Navigation on Sedov and Kruzenstern. Uh, the statistic about this type of uh, club is not full, because they all operate now as a separate item and you know, Russia is a really big country, but for my opinion, this system of uh, local clubs for youngsters uh, will be the base for all maritime education soon, as it was in Soviet time. So we just have to build this structure again. Uh, many people in Russia, they think that uh, sailing is a sport. So now sailing sport in Russia is growing, growing actively. You know that uh, there is some uh, really big uh, team uh, as a synergy, Rus 7, Nika, they are start racing RC44, they are racing dragons, and there is many uh, children's school who is uh, racing mostly optimist, and now Gazprom uh, show a big interest to sailing, maybe you even heard about new class Gazprom 160, and about Nord Stream race uh, regatta we just uh, finished on Baltic. Uh, and Gazprom invested huge money in sailing sports. This Nord Stream race regatta, I think the budget uh, about a couple of million euros. But to ho hold this regatta, Gazprom uh, bought uh, five yachts, about five million euro each. And uh, this is a picture of, uh, you see this um, blue logos on the optimist sails. This is the design about Gazprom. They invested in big, uh, uh, regatta and the competition in St. Petersburg for children in optimist class. So if we will just uh, collect all the statistics together, you can see that we have five tall ships, about 20 yachts, okay, let's say 50 sailing ore boats, maybe 50 local maritime clubs, and a lot of sports schools. So uh, we can evaluate that uh, up to 3,000 uh, Russian youngsters uh, involved in sail training annually touching this uh, sailing world. Uh, I don't know, is it enough for the country which has 11 seas, three oceans, countless rivers and lakes? Our coastline is the uh, biggest. Uh, we have um, up to 40,000 kilometers. 
and we have our population 143 million people. Uh, it's just uh, the question which I would like just to place in the air. Uh, comparing with New Zealand, uh, Dean, how many youngsters you have in a year? 2,200. 2,200, uh, 4 million. So I'm not good in arithmetic, but after this session I will take calculator. I will calculate. So, which uh, really point of basement we have in Russia? We have strong tradition of salient practice in professional education. We have big fleet of state-owned sail training doll ships. We have really many enthusiasts for sailing all around the country, not only in St. Petersburg and Vladivostok, actually all around the country. We have tradition of sail training activity for all ages, for school children, students, and uh, then adult people since Soviet times. And uh, the country has obvious necessity in professional so sailors for growing merchant, fishing, and uh, Navy fleet. Uh, and uh, we have growing popularity of sailing sport. But as well, what challenges do we have? Uh, the state toll ships uh, have clear system for cadets or students, but if you are not a cadet of these five academies, uh, you have no clear system how to join this type of sailing. Uh, university lost their yachts. In Soviet time, it was about 30 university-owned big uh, yacht sail training yacht. Now it's only 10 in the University of Water Communication. Uh, if our youngsters will pay a full price activity in yacht, it seems to be expensive for them. So we need the system to reduce this price. For example, when partly it's paid by university or state budget or private donation. Uh, we have no state system for maritime education before you become a student age, so before you are 16, uh, the, our government still start to building maritime education. Uh, and we have no finance support for non-governmental uh, uh, sale training activities. If you are a private initiative, uh, you need to spend some years and uh, actually the financing you will get uh, sometimes is not sensible. Sometimes you spend more time and money to get this small government donation, and you say, okay, we will earn this money ourselves. We can do the day trip, corporate activity. So more challenges. Uh, it's a really complicated question of licensing for sailing skipper, especially for small boats, not for professional maritime. We now it's a question that it's changing of uh, law system. And there is, up to the moment, no clear answer how I can be a yacht skipper in Russia. We are waiting, it will be better in, after a year. Um, there is um, no uh, clear in the, in the mind, in the, uh, uh, like, uh, pe people, the question, how I can go sail? Yes, and there is no obvious and simple answer in Russia. We have uh, the image of sailing as an oligarch sport. This is a myth, high, high price for sailing, and many people uh, stopped with this myth. We have a strong language barrier. You can feel it just now when I am speaking, and I have to say that I am a star. I have a special sailing English course, and I teach sailing English, and you can imagine how the others know English, and we have to improve this. This is a Soviet heritage when the country was isolated. Uh, we have disintegration of our sailing activities and uh, uh, leaders. For example, we still have no sail training association in Russia, as you know, this obvious fact, and I hope that soon it will be changed, but we have to create this. And uh, we have what I call information vacuum, really lack of information about sailing opportunity. Uh, not even proposal, come and sail with me, just the information. The sailing of tall ship, this is uh, this type of life, the sailing small yachts, this type of life, if you want sport, okay, this is another world. So this information vacuum. And uh, so what I can 
myself privately answered all these challenges and questions. I am doing uh, many sail training projects uh, since 2009. My first project was uh, building standards, even then standards was under construction when it was Atlantic Challenge. And you know, in the year of 2009, uh, when uh, one of the biggest uh, tall ship races uh, fleet visited St. Petersburg, we have a big uh, uh, city recruitment uh, program to recruit uh, 200 uh, youngsters and uh, send uh, uh, 18 uh, vessels. It was three uh, square riggers and 15 yachts. Uh, and uh, when the regatta was finished, all these uh, active, uh, talented young people, they were looking for next opportunity, for the next step. I say, oh, Zlata, we want to sail, where to go? Uh, and I said, okay, I can't uh, make my sail training project. This is a wonderful team. This is a great yacht. They are those people looking for newcomers. And I realized we just have to provide information to collect it from sail training uh, operators and give it to the youngsters, to our potential participants. So we tried to create this uh, web project, sailtraining.ru. Uh, after two years of operation, uh, it's still um, not uh, very structured. I would like after five or ten years, come as a dean and say, okay, took, 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 this is a money source, this is a people, that is a system. Uh, it's on the stage of uh, proto-moving. <laughs> So, but there is at least uh, six uh, direction of activity now. We create in this information flow is my personal challenge and a struggle for many, many years. Uh, we have a special project in this uh, moment, what we call and sailing we were. One of my friend uh, who is professor for linguistic told me that this grammatical form is um, translated and sailing we were. I will tell a little bit later with more details. We are arranging learning courses and trainings. We do sailing events. We have volunteer program and our new branch is for small kids. Ron, what do we have of time? Uh oh, the most interesting. Okay, so um, information vacuum. I just write in text, 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 publish, send uh, any magazines. Everybody takes it, but nobody except me is not writing. For example, here for the conference, I sent about free release link in Russian, because uh, this is the fact uh, Russian people is not searching uh, internet in English, they're not reading in English, even not use this online translating. So we have to place Russian letters if we want Russian people to read the information. And if you're in New Zealand one day, want to see Russian trainees, send you materials, I will translate it because Russian will not read this in English letters. This is a fact. So during two years, it was like 500, many, many analytical issues prepared and we will continue. And we also do reposts, republish. And uh, our, uh, the newest project is when uh, the Sidov is sailing and I am making the series of historical issues with uh, archive, uh, archive illustration of 200 years old, uh, like accompanying, because it's more interesting to read, uh, not about, only about, okay, Sidov is sailing, uh, so watches, uh, routine, and so on, okay, new country, but when we place historical facts, how it was on Kruzenstern and Lysansky epoch, it become more attractive. One of my uh, very my beloved project and sailing we were. It's just a simple idea. After the navigation, all sailing team, projects, vessels invited to make a report where you were, where you go next year, what is the condition to join you next summer, just to place this information. It's uh, about 15 team presenting their materials and uh, we publish this in web uh, in order for people can during the year find it and then contact directly to the sale training operators. And one of our principles, which is not easy to realize, that this report have to be made not with a leader of the team, with the, one of the young sailors. 
for them, it's their own challenge. It's uh, very interesting to see how they do, but uh, they're successful. This is the world of Russian sail training. Uh, I can invite you to visit sailtraining.ru. <laughs> the only problem, it's all in Russian. But maybe you can uh, take this, this presentation. There's a lot of picture in it. So you, maybe you can find this uh, standard, Akela, Mir, uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, so just uh, touch the world of Russian sail training. It's much more than free than jammers. Okay, our next part is uh, the f uh, learning, studying uh, project. Uh, we do this sailing English on different levels. Uh, short and early course, it's for trainees and leisure officers. Uh, we have the like, uh, first step uh, uh, rigging uh, of sail training ships, it's just like uh, free short uh, lectures. Uh, what I want to see after this is just to uh, know what's uh, sail, uh, different types, which is bark and where is Bermudan sloop to tie five knots and to know the word uh, sheet and halyard during free lesson, but this uh, gives the newcomers uh, illusion of confidence that they now can go sail. And this encourages them to go. And during these lessons as well, I say, okay, you can sail this yacht and this. It become a consultant for newcomers. Uh, for team leaders, this is uh, very important uh, people for us. Uh, we do things like project management. We give them uh, management skill, help them uh, to organize their own crew. And uh, for uh, organized crew, we do kind of uh, team building because um, basically I'm a, s a trainer for social skill and one of my highest point is for Atlantic Challenge historical seamanship um, uh, crew. In 2008, we add this element of uh, team building and they won the world championship. <laughs> so it works, we can add this element as well. Uh, these uh, courses are free for youngsters because I have the same courses for adults for payment. I have my rather professional course, Sailing English for day skippers, for those who is going to United Kingdom, RYA system. Of course, when I have my adult course, it's pay, pay, pay for payment. And this short course for trainees is free for students. It's about 200 people annually we involve. We just help them to have more special skills. Uh, we do our sail training events. Uh, so f what can be, when the set off was leaving St. Petersburg, we invite four sail and oar boats. Or when uh, Mars Corporation from Moscow contact me for the sail for uh, corporate yachting, we just organize it on sail training yachts in Finnish Gulf. This is a first step, and we have this uh, start yachting trip, which is just the first step on deck. And uh, if we have chance, we can send to wind jammers to sail tall ships. Uh, our new part, but not two years we have, it's a volunteer program. This is the same story, but our, after 2009, we have a group of uh, dedicated people who would like to, to pay their efforts and uh, they ask me, Zlata, oh, we want to help. So now I have an activity, I just call people who is making uh, sailing or sea activities, especially for like children competition, Russian championship in optimist class. And I ask them, do you need volunteers? They say, yes, we need. And I call my volunteers, who want to be an optimist championship to help children start sailing. So just a system of distribution. Uh, the very bright moment uh, was in 2011 uh, for City Day celebration. It was an incredible show. 18 Finnish steamship. So can you imagine this, is, this picture? They are all working. It, it's something, F fin Finland is great to, so to keep this uh, flotilla. And it was in the center of St. Petersburg, where the Hermitage is. 
they were circulating mega steam and uh, it was 100 Finnish guys, so 18 vessels, and we make a service about 30 volunteers uh, like working as Lajan officers. And uh, many uh, uh, Tolshi races uh, volunteers join us as a Lajan officer. And now we involve them to smaller regatta as it's adventure race, 80 degrees uh, sailing to inner waterways. Uh, and um, this uh, summer we have a bright project on the Dvartsova Square, it was animation zone for children, and our volunteers were working for this. Uh, many children championship this summer, our volunteers was involved. As, as well, it's just a way to make a first step. Uh, it's uh, not easy to go sailing in country where the sailing is not common. But uh, if you uh, help children with their small optimist, uh, just maybe giving lunch for them, uh, if uh, they um, serve as a Lajan officer and they, oh, can I sail with you? Oh, they have one hour sailing and the next step is much more easy. I meet my volunteers after a year or two on the deck of different vessels sent in different teams. So volunteers, volunteering is really uh, the door to the world of sailing. Uh, our new branch, it's a program for kids. One uh, sailing school just invited me and they asked to help the young sportsman who is going to international competition with some dozen of uh, English words. So we start to make uh, sailing English. Uh, but uh, for school people, we sometimes hold, it's in picture on the next slide, here, you see. This is a, just a one hour lectures. What is it tall, what, what is it tall ship? Um, we do excursions for small children for Mir and Sedov. And it's a not easy thing because <laughs> you know that small children, they start to touch anything. But okay, we say, please, please, we do this excursion. Uh, they uh, keep information flow about children's sailing sports. We recruiting volunteers for these events and our new, our last uh, item, yes. Uh, I have uh, actually my co-reporter, yes. Uh, st uh, appeared when I have a problem to contact with, with, with sailing English with children and now he become a separate character and uh, kept, uh, the second captain of Sedov uh, take him to circumnavigation and up to the moment we are here and this plush cat, like a Murzilka sailing cat, he is on Sedov, pay attention here. This is a cat crossing equator. It's, it's a real, it's a picture made on the moment Sedov crossed the equator. And this, as you see, it's a cat on a Cape Horn. So you can even find Murzilka on Facebook. He has his own account. Just put sailing cat Murzilka and you can follow him. The idea that after this uh, trip, Murzilka will write a book for children where he will say in very simple children language, this is a mast, this is a ship, this is a wind, this is it, our idea. Yes. And everybody, very serious people become <laughs> much more easy and <laughs> friendly when we will. So this is our new, new project. Okay, what's the idea of all our sometimes look a little bit crazy when such an adult girl with small plush toys? Uh, our idea is unite community of Russians, unite people who are dedicated to sailing even now, to build a system of involving new people to open this door in this wall, to create a web sport, the field, the space for communication, um, 
we would like to open Russian doors to international world to translate finally our information to in, uh, information to English language. And uh, my only dream is to see more vessels under Russian flag, more Russians under all flags, and more sails on Russian waters with any flags on it. So you are invited. Uh, so you can contact me if you have ideas, if you have uh, spaces for your, uh, for example, any, any nation, if you want to invite Russian youngsters, send to me information, I will try to give it to uh, young people. Uh, if you want to visit Russia, or if you want to send uh, your youngsters to Russian vessels, just something interesting, just join our sail training crew. Okay. Thank you.